All right, everyone. So welcome to our live learning how to have a little swimming workshop. We'll give it a few minutes here, let some people join. We started one minute late here by our time, but we'll just give everyone a couple minutes here, get set up. If you haven't joined us already, you're going to need a couple of things, especially if you're new to the kettlebell swing. One thing that would suggest is this. Uh, foam roller, if you have one. If you don't, it's not important. A broomstick. If you have one of these, great. If you have a swiffer, undo the end of the swiffer. Basically, we just need a, a long pole. That's pretty much it. If you don't have one of these, that's not important either. You can still, you can still do exactly what we're doing. Um, this is just useful. We're going to save this to our YouTube channel for all the videos, so you can watch this later on. There's also a, a pretty lengthy description in the show notes here. Have a look at that. One of the most important things here is the comment section. Although we're not able to read the comment section as we're doing this. We will be going ahead and reading the comment section afterwards and responding to them. So that's how we'll be able to answer all of your questions afterwards. Let me just take a look here for a second. All right, perfect. Okay, we'll start it off here. This is a how to count a swing workshop, but the most important part of this, and it's actually something that we've never discussed at any of our live workshops we've done in the past or any of our classes, but it's how to perform the kettlebell swing at home. Now, as we were preparing for this, it was very interesting because, and well, what's so different about the kettlebell swing at home? We take for granted the stability of our training environment when we're training in a gym or any other training atmosphere that we might regularly go to. What do I mean by that? Everybody in your normal training space is familiar with what goes on. We come here to train, right? You know that there are, you know, we're moving barbells, there's resistance bands, there's anchor points, there's people moving their own body weight, barbells, dumbbells, kettlebells, maces, all sorts of different things, right? So people in your normal training environment, they're familiar with what goes on in that environment. That being said, they know how to reduce their risk in that environment by watching it. For example, if I'm here swimming the kettlebell, they don't stay well far away from where I am. Well, they might, they should. So if I'm going to be starting off my kettlebell swing, you know, listen, stay away from that person because they need to have a room to swing. In your house and with your family members, this is not the environment that training normally happens in. So one of the things that's very important is to think about informing those people that there's training happening here. So tell the people in your home, listen, I'm going to be training downstairs and I just give you a heads up, don't come barreling around the corner because you might get clipped in the head with this kettlebell. First of all, that's all for the adults, right? All the people that are understand what's going on. But for small children, think about your pets. One of the things we see in videos is that people are training and all of a sudden, you know, their cat comes and crawls on them or their dog comes and crawls on them. Well, if that happens, that your pet, you know, they're softly treading across the ground and you're swinging the kettlebell, they walk behind you and hike that kettlebell, we're talking about the potential for causing serious harm to your pets but also to your small children, right? So what I would recommend is this. You would not normally do this in a gym, but think about home safety and kettlebell training. Either put a partition across open doorways that would stop any small children or animals from coming in and create that partition in such a way that if one of those, you know, if it's a small child or a pet, they breach that partition, there's a noise in it. So you can be focused on what's coming in the room, right? Think about the safety of those people that are going in and out of your room unexpectedly, not knowing that there's going to be somebody swinging a heavy object there. So the first step is informing people, hey listen, I'm training in this area. For those that can't be informed either because they're pets or small children, partition off the area in such a way that if they did come into the area, 
it would be difficult enough if it would catch your attention. Because if you're swimming this kettlebell, you're focused on what you're doing. You're not really focused on if something is especially walking behind you, right? So keep that in mind. And even though you've been training for a very long time, or even if you're just starting, considering the safety of those around you is very important. So think of both of those two things. The second thing, if you're training in your garage at home, make sure that you have passed on the same information to those people in your house. You don't want to have the garage door kind of flying open at ground level and you smoke somebody with the kettlebell. So just inform those in your house, in your environment that you're training to keep them safe. The next thing, if you are thinking about, well, how much room do I need to train at home? Well, if you take a look at your kettlebell, let's just take this one here, for example, from the handle to the base. So this is, you know, this is a, a smaller kettlebell. Let's say like a heavier kettlebell, like 20 kg or so. Your arm length plus, let's just say, 14 inches, right? So that's how much space you should have around you here. That's how much space you have around you. So there should be, ideally, no coffee tables, no people, no speakers, no computer wires, no laptops, anything. That, I mean, prepare for the worst situation. So keep it safe, right? And you may think, oh, it's a little over the top. Well, you know what? In accidents, you often hear, first thing after an accident, I never saw that happen before. So let's keep the, the risk your property reduced to, risk to the people in your house and pets in your house reduced as low as possible. So if you've been to our workshops before, we've never actually had, we've never said this before because we've never been speaking in the context of where it's almost a necessity to be training in your house with people or pets that might be unfamiliar for what you're doing, right? So keep that in mind. That's probably one of the most important things we're going to say today is Prepare to train at home safely. That's one of the most important things because if stuff goes wrong, I mean, it's going to be a catastrophe for everybody involved. So just please be safe. Be uh, One of the things about swimming in a kettlebell is you must have body awareness. But when you're training at home, you must have situational awareness of what's happening. Okay, So please keep that in mind and pass that on. I mean, if you're listening, you have experience. Pass that on to your friends that may have just started training at home as well. Spread the word and be safe so you can keep your at-home training practice sustainable. Okay, so what is the kettlebell swing? I was talking to somebody yesterday and said, well, you know, it should be called something else because whenever we see the swing, the most, the most noticeable thing for anyone that's just watching the swing is we see the kettlebell raising up. And so if the kettlebell is raising up, it must be my arms that are doing the work. Well, that's, uh, that's not the case. Okay, so we're going to try to dismiss a couple of myths right here where the kettlebell is not a uh, swing, it's not an arm raise, and the kettlebell swing is not a squat. Okay, the kettlebell swing is a hip hinge. So what I mean by that is that your hips are going to be coming back into this position, like this. It's different than a squat where the squat is dominated by knee flexion while the hip hinge is dominated by this movement here, okay? So keep that in mind as we're talking. So one of the things first is like, well, how do we get warmed up for this kettlebell swing? In your training environment, we would prepare differently if we were in a gym setting, if you had anchor points for resistance bands, if you had a lot of equipment available. But we're not, uh, I mean, we, don't, we do have those things at our disposal, but we're not going to show you those things for warming up because you know what? If you're training at home, you, you might not have access to those things. And if you do decide to, you know, anchor some bands, anchor points, those might not be appropriate to sustain the load of your resistance band might end up in a wreck, right? So the first thing we're going to start off with here is if you're at home watching and you actually want to to participate and do this, and I invite you to stand up. And the first thing we're going to do here, and it's actually difficult because not knowing uh, the fitness level of anybody here, so we're going to walk you through something where it's called an inchworm. You don't need to actually move across the floor, you can actually just do it in place. So we're going to go into a high plank or a push up position here. And this is what we're going to do. We're going to go through uh, 10 repetitions of basically 
walking your feet forward and then walking them back, maintaining your neutral spine, bracing your core and your shoulders while you do this. So this will be the first part of our walk for our kettlebell swing home workout. We're going to go into this position here. Now make sure you take the shoulders, pull them in the back pocket here. We don't want to be like this. We're going to tuck the tailbone in. You're going to feel your lower abdominals engage. Walk the feet up nice and slow here. Keep the knees straight. Once you've got to a position that you cannot go any further, take a breath out. Push, keep the palms flat. And then slowly walk the feet back here like this. That's one. Repeat again. Breathe out. Two. Come back to the starting point every time in, in this high plank push position. Three. Four. The idea is, is that every time we do this, we're trying to get our feet closer and closer to our hands. Five. Now for number six, we're going to do something different. We're going to come to the middle here, and we're going to pause. Keep your feet a little wider apart. Right about there. Now push back, and then side to side here. Just twice per side. That's one. Two feet together. Walk the feet back here. Number seven. Number eight. Good. When we're starting, make sure the shoulders are over the hands. Here like so. Keep the bracing again. 
One, two, three, four, and five. We'll switch it up. One. How's that? As I mentioned before here, the purpose of this is to feel the contraction in your glutes as you come to the top of the bridge. You're not driving this leg back and forth at all. This leg just stays as it is. Four, and then five. Good. So we did, or we completed, five double leg glute bridges, five single leg glute bridges, and then we did 10 in place inch runs. So what's happening next? If you're going to do this outside of this live workshop we're doing here, I would recommend doing this exercise first. Considering the time of day and the circumstances that we're in right now, this might likely be maybe the first thing you've done in the morning. So we, we're doing this exercise first because, or in this position of third, because it requires us to be a little more focused and warmed up, right? But normally, your single leg or balance work would be put in the first spot in your warps or your conditioning because it normally requires the most focus and is the most demanding, even though it is only a body weight exercise. We did the other, uh, basically three exercises here, the interim and the, and the, and the glute bridge and its variations first, to warm you up, to get you moving, to kind of wake you up, because if you haven't woken up yet, starting off with the balance activity, might not be a good start to your day and might just, you know, set off the workshop and have like, like a frustrated mindset. So that's not the point here. What we're going to be doing here is using this foam roller as a guide for this movement here. Okay. Hand on the hip. And basically what I'm going to be doing is just pushing my hips back here. And one thing that I'm not doing is I'm not doing this. I'm not going to be kicking against the foam roller. This foam roller is being used as a guide to keep my back leg straight. Because sometimes when left to our own devices, when we're just starting off with this single leg body weight RDL, is that we get some, we get a bit of twisting here, the leg starts to wander. This is basically used as a way to actively stabilize your non-working leg, or I should say, the leg that's not grounded, because this leg is definitely working, but your non-grounded leg. Okay, so we're going to use this as a, as a cue to keep your leg straight, but also we're going to use it to actively stabilize this leg as it's going back. When this leg is going back, think about pushing the leg back. Just don't let it come back because you, when you move it, you're going to have muscular activity it's going to help stabilize your joints. You don't want this base just kind of hanging out here. You want to actually actively push the leg back, use the foam roller to guide this leg in a straight line. That's the goal of this exercise here. So <clears throat> we're going to come into this position here. So as I'm coming forward, the weight is going through my base foot here. I can feel my big toe, little toe, and my heel staying in contact. When I get to about here, I'm going to drive my hip forward and squeeze my glutes. Now, it might make sense that we did the hip bridge or the glute bridge first because now you're familiar with, okay, that's how it feels when my glutes contract. So we're going to take that sense that we had before from the, from the glute bridge and bring it over to this standing exercise here. Hip comes back here. Pause, hip forward. Here, hip forward. Here, forward one more. Pause here, and then squeeze. Good. As you're going back here, this is my leg that needs the most work for balance. Okay. 
four, five. Good. Okay. So there's a lot of similarities here between what we did here with the single leg RDL and the glute bridge, both with two legs and with one legs. There's a lot of ways to teach the kettlebell swing, but sometimes we like to go in the back door and do a little bit tricky to kind of get you moving in a way that we want you to move without actually kind of labeling it. So this exercise, the glute bridge, single and double leg, both require us to hinge our hips, right? So this is, this is the main thing with the kettlebell swing is mastering and consistently executing the hip hinge, right? We ask you to bring the dowel or bring your Swiffer or bring something that you can hold behind you. Let me just check the comments here one second. Okay, so we use this dowel. Like so. Now, if you can see, my hand can fit behind this broomstick, right? So I'm going to make sure that I tuck my tailbone in. And the dowel is touching the head all the way to the back. Now what's going to happen here is hips come back from here, pause, the same way that we did with our full roll exercise here, pause, stand up, squeeze the glutes here. As you're going to push your hips back, you want to make sure that your feet maintain contact with the ground here. Sometimes the case is that as we're shifting the hips back, we don't have our knees bent enough, and then we start to lose the grounding of our toes. So you have to make sure there's going to be a proper ratio of knee bend to hip movement to make sure that the feet stay grounded. So really think about how your foot is interacting with the surface below you. Are you grounded? Are your feet maintaining contact? They call it a foot tripod. Big toe, little toe, and heel. Think about those three points of contact maintaining their position on the ground and are load bearing at all times, okay? So when you're doing this hinge activity or hinge exercise, you wanna make sure that you're gonna be maintaining weight distribution through those three points here, So this movement is required for us to successfully execute the kettlebell swing. So now we have a, a little handful of exercises for your warm-up. We started off with the 10-inch arms in, in place, right? To get the increased circulation, body temperature increased, to get the hamstring stretched out, think about shoulder stabilization, then we went down to the glute bridge for five reps for two legs, and then we did single leg reps. We did the spacing. We, we had our heel, middle finger away to get the distance right. We did the single leg RDL. And then we did the hip hinge with the broomstick. Now, what exercises does the kettlebell swing work? This is one of the major things that we always ask. Like, what does it work? Like, what's the purpose of the kettlebell swing? I mean, the kettlebell swing has a will have whatever purpose that the programming requires it to have. You could be swinging heavy, you could be swinging light, one hand, two hands, it all really depends on what the objectives of your training are, right? I say this because people say, well, how does the kettlebell swing uh, train your core? The two back of the kettlebell swing, we're gonna go into this position here and we're gonna give you a little bit of an example of the amount of core activation that's required in one sense when we're doing the kettlebell swing. So you can see I have a lot of, a lot of stuff building up here. So talk before we'll keep the area clutter free. We'll move this over here. We're gonna get into this dead bug position here. So we're gonna use space on the ground, have you laying flat on your back. When we did the loop bridge, we kind of primed you up for this one already. We said that when you're laying on your back, 
You want to have your back flat against the ground. So essentially what happens is when we're on the ground, we fall into this default position, right? So tuck your tailbone in, like so. Here, tuck your tailbone in. When you do that, you're going to feel your lower abdominals engage. So that's what we're going to be aiming for when we're laying on the floor here in this dead bug position. Engage your lower abdominals to help keep your lumbar spine straight. Let's lay down here. Let's give it a try. So, in this position here. Now, hands up here, legs up here, and push your back against the ground. Pack the shoulders against the ground too. There we go. We're going to feel the lower abdominals engage here. The whole rest of the abdominals should be engaged here because we're not letting the back arch here. Push the back flat against the ground, squeeze and hold. So at the top of the uh, at the top of the kettlebell swing, that is what you should be feeling in your abdominals. Right? You should be feeling your abdominals contract at the top of the swing to help stabilize your spine. So we're not going to be going into this extended position. Sometimes I like to call put the brace on as you come to the top of your swing. Flex the abs, brace. So that as as the kettlebell coming into this turtle position at its float, we're not going to be leaning back. The muscle group that contributes to us coming to this position is your right abdominus, right? So keeping your shoulder on top of your hip at the top of your swing requires massive core strength to help stabilize you. So keep the core engaged. Think about this exercise here. So why, at what point do I stop doing this? You should never stop doing these. Part of getting set up for your kettlebell training is consistency with your movement prep uh, strategy, right? We're not saying to be dogmatic or do these things all the time for the rest of your life. As you, as you find more and more ways to cue yourself or how do some people say pull your cage down, flex your abs, the more ways you can prep yourself to develop sensory cues for how it feels to engage the muscle groups that will be working, the better. Warming up is very important for your kettlebell swing because you're not only activating the muscle, but you're building the sense of how it feels to engage those muscles when certain demands are placed on them, right? So that's why we've done these things here. So we've done the warm up. We've talked about the hinge, right? Now we're going to talk more about the actual kettlebell swing itself. At the juncture where we talked about having the broomstick here and coming back, a big question that we often get asked is, how far apart should my feet be when I'm swinging my kettlebell? This is a good question. An explanation that I've learned about recently, which was, I think it's, any explanation is not hard and fast, like it's not the explanation. There may be better versions in the future. There may have been better ones that have been said in the past that I didn't come across. But at this particular moment, and for me, this seems to be a very effective way of setting up your feet for your kettlebell swing. When we think about kettlebell swing, we think about stabilizing your base. Now, we said this in a different way before. We said, the foot tripod, big toe, little toe, and heel, stabilize the base. In terms of stabilizing your base, when you think about well, how far should my feet be, it's called the jump test. So if you were to jump, and I mean, if it's safe for you to jump, you might replicate this you know, exercise or demonstration at home. If it's not safe for you to jump, don't go ahead and jump because I told you to. If you are safe to jump and everything is good in your life, your knees are good, your hips are good, you have no injuries, etc., all the liability stuff aside, follow along and jump. So we're going to come from here, watch out the ceiling, you have no bars here, no lights, from here. How I jumped, how I landed, that foot position there should be a perfect position for me to kettlebell swing. You wouldn't land out here. 
you would land like this. You're going to land most likely feet forward with your feet just underneath or outside of your hips. So think about that. How far are my feet supposed to be when I kettlebell swing? The jump test is a good way to set your feet up. Okay. So we've got the hinge pattern down. We've answered the question, how far should my feet be? Now the next question is, how do I start to swing? Okay. If you have a kettlebell, safely pick it up. I'm going to do it from a side position so you can see how this all goes down. Let's see if you put it down. Okay. If you're new to training totally, or if you're not new to training, one of the progressions that we show for the kettlebell swing is the kettlebell deadlift. So it's based on the same movement pattern as the swing. The difference is is that the kettlebell doesn't come from in between your legs, it comes from off the ground. Now, we talked before about the swing being not a squat, but being hip dominant from here. This is something tricky when you're using cast iron kettlebells. Cast iron kettlebell handles are different heights based on the weight. So the lighter the kettlebell is, the lower you're going to have to go to the ground, which means, let me show you, is that your kettlebell deadlift might be a little bit more squatty. It might be a little bit more knee dominant than your kettlebell swing will be. And that's okay, because you're going to have to reach lower to the ground, and without going into a totally flexed position for your spine, you're going to have to accommodate the lower handle height by bending your knees more. So let me show you some variations. We have another one here that's outside the view of the camera. I'll pull it over here safely once we're, once we're done uh, lifting up this one here. So if you are using White Lion Athletics kettlebells in your kettlebell training, the kettlebell here that I'm using, if you can't see the colored rings, is plum. So our plum colored kettlebell rings are for our 10 kg kettlebell. I want you to look at my knee. Can you see that? Let me move it back over here. Which makes you wonder we're able to see anything on the floor. I guess we'll watch later and find it. Okay. So when we're doing the kettlebell deadlift, where do I position the kettlebell? I'm thinking about having the handle, like the horn here, this part of this curved part of the horn, in line with my ankle bone. Right there, okay? So that's, that's the position for the kettlebell. Now, here's where it gets tricky. When we did our hinging before, we had the broomstick. That was for our, our hinge. When we did the single leg RDL, we had a foam roller. When we did the glute bridge on the ground, we had the floor as a cue to, how, to uh, kind of set us up and know that we're our spine is neutral. We had the floor there to give us feedback. Now when I'm standing here, I don't have any cues behind me. I, I don't have nothing touching my back, so how do I know my back is straight? This is when we have to start to think about how it felt to have your lower abdominals braced when we're in that dead butt position on the floor, and how it felt to keep our back straight before we did our glute bridge. So that's why those things were important because we created that sense of engagement. We knew how it felt. Now we're going to have to replicate that without having anything against our back to tell us that our spine is straight. With the hinge, we had the broomstick. With the glute bridge, we had the floor. Now we have nothing except the memory of how it felt to brace. We're going to have to rely on that memory now. A friend of ours, Jody from uh, Kettlebell Kickboxing Canada, she always does this. I know it's, at first I was like, why does she do this? But it's, it's the setup that's important. And you, might, uh, and you might only use this once, or you might use it always as a way to cue yourself, which I think is actually pretty good. It took me a while to understand that, wait a minute, that's actually 
in all of your videos she shows the exact same setup which I think is awesome so shout out to her because it's a I think it's a good method take three fingers here you have this hip crease here take these three fingers here middle fingers to the crease you have this finger on the abdomen this finger on your thigh so middle fingers to the crease here now as you can see look at this no good not braced I'm going to remember how it felt to brace my core by flexing my lower abdominals <sighs> okay hard stomach we're, we're feeling good we're feeling solid shoulders back here fingers hips push the hips back pause <sighs> thrust relax <sighs> brace the core <sighs> shoulders packed push the hips back here <sighs> there we go your lower abdominals are controlling this movement here at the top of your kettlebell deadlift we're not doing this that's when you have to turn the brakes on flex your abdominals keep your spine straight shoulder on top of the hip one more time so we're doing this because we're getting the sense of pushing our hips back from here we don't want to do this when we're when we're doing your kettlebell deadlift if height allows for it so alignment we'll handle the kettlebell in line with the ankle bones okay hips come back here slide the hands down the thighs here find the handle <sighs> up no extension slowly slide the kettlebell back down hinging at the hips Stand up. Kettlebell deadlift. This exercise is good to get warmed up for your swings. It doesn't matter if you've been swinging one million swings or this is the first swing you've ever done. Kettlebell deadlift is a great warm up. Find out how you're feeling. Bring it into your practice and decide it's a great exercise to do outside of the kettlebell swing warm up. One of the things we're talking about here is it being squatty that's why we have this light kettlebell so you'll see how much my knees have to bend to get down to the handle it's lower it's okay we're going to switch it out here so now you'll see with the higher handle i don't have to bend down as far you see the difference there is almost half an inch. That's the difference in height, right? So you're going to have more knee bend with your kettlebell deadlift for your 10 kg then you will have with your 28 kg that's totally fine that's just due to the design of the kettlebell but be conscious of that so if you think well i have to bend my knees too much with a lighter kettlebell that's fine so the kettlebell deadlift is a great exercise for warming up for your kettlebell swing because up until up until that point you've only been doing body weight so now this is the first introduction to a warm-up when you're going to use external load is the kettlebell deadlift so we have we introduced the kettlebell deadlift because we wanted to do a loaded a loaded hip hinge pattern which was the kettlebell deadlift so we have the hip hinge we understand how to stabilize our spine from the bottom to the top by engaging our abdominals we understand that the foot spacing for the kettlebell swing should be the same distance we land when we land from a jump we've done the loaded hinge pattern with a kettlebell deadlift we've done that successfully if not repeat let me just go 
uh, normally I would do this too, as I would go around and have a look at everybody, and I'd say, hey, wait a minute, listen. When you are doing your kettlebell deadlift, make sure you keep your arms close to you, engage your lats. So that's an important thing to think about too, is that I used a line here. This, there's a line right here, and I'll show you this. Pick a spot on the floor when you're doing your kettlebell deadlift, and I'm showing you this because we're gonna get you to engage your lats during your kettlebell deadlift, that's why we're showing you this. Placing the kettlebell back in its starting point every time will require that you pull your arms into your body, and when you do this, your lats and long head of triceps are gonna to contribute to creating this movement where we go like this. So you're keeping your lats engaged, keeping the kettlebell close to your body. So sometimes when we do the kettlebell deadlift here, so three fingers, bracing the core here. Sometimes when we see it done, when we started, remember the kettlebell handles were at the ankles, right? So now it's coming further in front of me and I have a look here. Now I'm gonna to have to lift from here. The weight is not as close to my body as it could be, therefore you might have some sheer force on your spine. Think about that. So if you notice that the kettlebell is moving ahead of you, we're gonna to have to engage your lats more, so keep your arms pulled tight into your body. Right there as you're hinging back, that will help you out with your kettlebell deadlift. Okay, so let me just check and see if we have any comments here. Okay, perfect. We're about 40 minutes in here. Now we're learning the hike. The hike is the starting uh, point of your kettlebell swing and setting up for a good hike will likely set you up for a safe and effective kettlebell swing that would probably see a better strength increase and less injuries in your kettlebell practice as a whole. So, now before we start with this, in gyms, we often think of our training centers wherever you train. Footwear seems to be really a non-issue, either when you're training barefoot, or I'm training in um, exercise specific shoes. I have specific shoe wear that I wear, or that you wear when I'm training at home, what do we wear? Slippers. Hopefully velvet slippers. Runners. Socks. Or bare feet. Okay. If you're training on carpet at home, I want you to consider that if you're in bare feet, actually, if you're going to be training, let's just say this, on laminate floor or on carpet, Training in bare feet might be good when you're starting off, but as the temperature, temperature of your tissue changes, the amount of traction you have is also going to change. So consider that, even though you might enjoy training barefoot in your gym if there's a rubber floor, it makes sense because actually the warmer your feet get to a certain degree, it's going to increase the amount of traction you have. On the other hand, if you're training on your carpet floor at home in bare feet, as your feet get warmer, the carpet might become slick or the bottoms of your feet might dry out as you're rubbing back and forth and then all of a sudden your feet are going to start to slip. Same thing with the laminate floor. So safely consider the shoe wear that you're going to wear in your home and the surface you're going to be training on. So consider that. If you're training in sh like your running shoes at home or some other rubber sole shoes, it really shouldn't matter, but just keep in, keep in mind that those surfaces in your house, they weren't most likely designed for training. So have a look at the floor, test it out. The last thing I'm gonna be doing is coming to the terminal end of your swing and you're flying backwards or something else happens. So be careful, assess the flooring, think about is this good enough to swing on? Do I have to make changes? Just be mindful, like don't take it for granted. Like all training surfaces are meant to train on 
It may pose specific challenges that you might not otherwise thought of because we're used to training in facilities that are meant and built for training. So please keep that in mind. Okay. The high pass. You will see people start off a kettlebell swing in many ways. Some people pick it up and they just start pounding away. That's one way of doing it. Other people will start with the kettlebell right underneath them, the same way that we did the kettlebell deadlift, and they'll start to pound away that way too. We're going to show you this, the hike. So setting up the hike is important because it allows you to stabilize your, your whole body before you accelerate that kettlebell, before you even move it. We're, we're trying to stabilize as much as possible. So we're going to go from the fingertips all the way to the toes. And then back again. So, foot position, jump test. Where I would land in my jump is how I'm going to be standing here. So, this is good. I feel okay. Now, how far do I space the kettlebell away from me before I start my swing? This is a good question, and there are a lot of methods that, are, that, that can be used. I think for our purposes, because I'm not seeing anybody and how they set themselves up, what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to get a good sense. I'm going to step back a bit. Okay. So I have my left foot on the ground here. I'm going to take my right heel, put it toward the big toe of my left foot, and pretty much I'm measuring out one shoe away. And then I have my other foot coming out here. So that's the distance that I'm going to pick. I'll let you know, this is important, and I'll let you know why in just a moment here. So now we have the distance of the kettlebell, right? So the kettlebell is positioned away from me at a specific way. So every, every, every time that I swing, I set this up the same way. Every single time. That's how I do it. It makes sure the distance of the kettlebell is always the same. As the kettlebell gets heavier, relative to my own ability, I bring the kettlebell measurably closer in ways that I have found to be good for me. But this works for, this will probably work for everybody watching, unless you start to work on like heavy single swings, heavy double swings and heavy triple swings, you might adjust the kettlebell so that it's a little bit closer towards you so you're not leaning or having your arms outstretched so far, okay? So we have this. The distance of the kettlebell has been established and we have a method for establishing that distance that we can use now in our kettlebell practice. So step one is good. Okay. Step two, now we hinge. Okay, so we're going to take this three finger pattern here, brace the core here, push the hips back here. Looking pretty good. So now, how do I know? This is the tough part, because if you don't have a mirror in front of you, it's hard to get a sense of what I might be talking about. When you sit up for your kettlebell height, your shoulders should be higher than your hips, okay? Because if we're gonna be bent over straight like this, we gotta fit this, first of all, there's a whole bunch of problems with this, and uh, one of which is that starting off, we're gonna be doing too much extension of your spine, the hip angle won't be right, to a relative to the torso angle. So when we're starting off with our hike, you want to make sure that your shoulders are higher than your hips. So what I'm saying is this, so position things the same, hinge, right there, bracing, right there. There you go. That'll be the position of, that's the uh, torso hip angle we're looking for. If your hamstrings are tighter, if your ankles don't have mobility, it is optimal. It might look a little bit different, but just generally speaking, we're going to be looking for this angle right there. Okay, perfect. The next thing that's important is the position of the kettlebell. Angle it. Here. If we keep the kettlebell flat, we're going to have to lift it up to accelerate. At that point, with the weight being so far away, you do not want to have to physically elevate the kettlebell. 
the hike. I mean, if you watch football, American CFL, CFL or NFL, it's called a hike pass because the center from here, they hike. This is the same thing, right? So we come from here, hinge, angle the kettlebell, that's it. The next thing is, with the kettlebell, so it's angled, spacing is good here. Now the next thing that I'm going to do is screw my arms in like this. Screw the arms in, screw the hands in, pull the shoulder blades in the back pocket like this. Now we're ready to hike. Obstacle is behind me. I know that. It should be fine. I think I'm going to go off onto an angle to make sure that I'm clear. There's going to be somebody at home who didn't pick up the cowbell safely. It was safe for me. It may not be safe for you. Keep that in mind. And just as a side note, <clears throat> the only reason why I watch YouTube or there's only some reason that I go to certain Instagram pages is for the comment section. So I really hope that these comments, like, either they're great, they're funny, or they're both, because if the comment section sucks, the video sucks. So be sure to put some comments in there, say some stuff. I don't really care if it's good or bad. I just like some feedback. Maybe make it better for you next time, or make it funnier next time, whatever. <clears throat> I love comments. So here we go, set it up, great. Here, hinge, perfect. Kettlebell, 45 degree angle, yes. Screw the arms in. Yes, we're set up. That's the setup. This part of my wrist here, this part of my wrist is coming right into the high thigh. This is an important position because every time the kettlebell comes back into the channel, my wrist is staying right here. At no time during your swing or, or your hike does the kettlebell drop below your knees. Otherwise, you have too much sheer force on your spine. So when you hike it, pull it in here. The hand sits right there. Somebody said one time, play chicken with your zipper. Try to hit yourself, you won't. High in the thigh. That's where you keep the hands, the wrist hits here. Every single time you swing, come back from here, accelerate, here, accelerate, the same spot every time. <clears throat> it's important because if you find that the kettlebell is dropping, safely end your set of swings, Recover, readjust, think about why that happened. There could be a number of different reasons, ranging from loss of grip strength due to um, a slippery handle, loss of foot position, core strength, just, you're just playing tired. That could be it. So <clears throat> this is a very important cue, the sensory cue here, high in the thigh, okay? So now, this movement, when the kettlebell comes back toward me, we're gonna be thinking about engaging our lats. This movement here, if you do any, like, say for example, you do a straight bar pull down on, um, on a universal from here, straight bar pull down, lats, long head triceps. The same thing with the hike. The hike pass is dominated by core stability, hip stability, and contraction of your lats. That's how we get it set up, okay? So spacing is good, check. Foot position is good, check. Hip hinge, check. Shoulder higher than hip, check. Lower abdominals brace. 45 degrees, screw the arms in, big breath in. So, as you can see, the kettlebell was not placed in the same spot every single time. If you noticed, rep three, I had to extend my torso a little bit. Because the kettlebell was further ahead, required more knee flexion, required me to change my knee angle as I hiked it. So find your spot on the floor and put that kettlebell in the same spot every single time you hike. But I'd recommend that you do height passes as a warm-up, but also when you're moving up weights in your kettlebell swing. So for example, if I can swing, say, 20 kg 
is a good working weight for me, but for whatever reason, I have the goal of swimming 28 kg. I can move with the 24 successfully, the 28, I can't safely swing it. So what I'm gonna to start to do then is I'm gonna practice my hike passes and build more volume hiking safely with my 24. Consistently aiming for the kettlebell being placed at ground at the same time, number one. Number two, I have this consistent pattern of placement of my wrist in the high thigh position here. So you can work, you can use your hike pass as a way to increase work capacity, increase your grip strength for working with kettlebells, uh, heavier kettlebells, uh, so that when you want to swing with a higher kettlebell, I wouldn't suggest just starting to swing with a higher kettlebell. Start with learning to hike pass safely, a higher weight kettlebell first, and then progress to a, to a swing from there. Okay, <clears throat> so the hike pass is important for getting stabilized in your setup. Please remember that. We got the spacing. Now we're gonna go into the full swing. <clears throat> if you are doing the full swing for the first time, it's gonna be very hard to kind of coach you through it, not seeing you. So one of the things I would suggest we're gonna do a dead stop swing. This is probably one of the most effective ways to train the kettlebell swing. Number one, because it requires you to come to a full stop at the end, set up your hike again, re-hike it and re-swing it, pause, set up, re-hike it, re-swing it. It basically is ingraining all of the fundamentals of the kettlebell swing into you rep after rep after rep. So if you are setting up consistently well, if you are doing all of the bracing that we talked about, if you are executing everything we've talked about, when you do a set of 10 single swings, you're gonna be actually having 10 hike passes and 10 single swings. So for every set, you're getting 10 more hikes, which requires a lot more effort than simply just pounding out 10 swings, right? So it's a great way to start off your kettlebell training. So say, well, you know, I got 15, I got 15 reps of swings today in my program. I got the kettlebell swings for 15. Okay. 15 dead stop swings would be a great way to do that. Most of all, to make sure that you're going to be having as much stabilization through your swing as possible. So let me show you the dead stop kettlebell swing. I'm not going to say anything because you've heard it a hundred times so far. Three dead stop swings. The float. How high should I raise the kettlebell? We're now going to talk about the different styles of swings hard style, sports style, American. We're just going to say that the swing we've showed you here, which would closely resemble the hard style swing, the kettlebell should float to both the sternum, right? So that's where we should, our, our hip drive, the strength of our hip drive should allow for us to safely accelerate the kettlebell up into this position or right over here. You'll see it. Some people bend the elbow. Some people keep the arm straight. Those things kind of exceed the scope of what we're talking about today. What we've just showed you are three dead stop kettlebell swings. At the top of my swing, abs are flexed. Now, I'd like you to look at something when, we're gonna, when I'm gonna do these next three. I want you to watch my head position, okay? It's going to change for every swing. And we're going to talk about each one of them 
when I've completed the three dead stop swings. Okay, number one, chin totally buried in my chest, like this. There is a cue to be giving cowbells, tuck your chin. One of my friends has mentioned to me that tuck my chin means to slightly nod yes, it doesn't mean to, to do that, right? So you don't want to have your cervical spine overly flexed like this at any point, at any point. The second one I see is very common, especially if we had mirrors in front of us, right? I'm watching myself swing, all the glory of my swing, the pounding looks so great. My head is like this, right? So, if I walked around like this, this would not this would be weird. My head's up, spine extended. But if I do this, you see that I'm looking ahead into the mirror that I was just looking into? Tuck your chin as if you were to nod yes. There we have it. Head stays here. <laughs> That's how we do it. <clears throat> so, at the top of your swing, gaze should be forward. As you come down here, gaze should be slightly forward, but you should not be in this extended position. Okay? So, we talked about neutral spine here. Pull it in from here, rib cage down. Now, we talk about neutral cervical spine. We don't want this, we don't want this, we just want this, okay? The breathing. When we get to the top of our swing from here, <sighs> breathe out. On the way back down, so once we got, this is the float. So we're in the float position here, what next? We talked about the wrist, I mentioned it a lot already during the hike pass, right? This wrist portion here, into the high thigh. At the, with the, at the terminal end of our swing here, one of the kettlebells floating, the next thing, hips are hinging, hinge the hips back, guide the hands back into the channel from here, and then come back to the top. So, everything we went over today can be definitely done in a lot more detail. You think, man, you've already talked for like over, over 50 minutes, how much work can you have? I could have as many cues as I have participants in the room, right? One thing, oh, well, I'll say this. One thing with kettlebells, there is not one cue. The cue that works best is the cue that is specifically designed for you to get you to safely move how you are intended to move in that activity. And that might be something that we've never said to anybody else before. So use a couple. Tuck your chin as you're nodding yes. Hip and the high thigh. Tuck your tail in. All these things, they're, they're generic. They're not specific. And that's one of the shortcomings of <clears throat> presenting a training session to you this way. Although they're the best intentions, we want you to learn how to safely swing a kettlebell at your house. And in your gym, you can take a lot of these things into your gym training too, like all the safety stuff we mentioned at the first, it might not be needed, but if, you know, the other stuff we talked about, setting up the hike, the kettlebell deadlift, the warm-up, <clears throat> all those things. The warm-ups, for example, are designed specifically with the individual in mind. We're looking at you, we're assessing you, and just because you came in and you're moving great yesterday, well, today is Monday, and all weekend was a certain situation, and now you're moving not so well, right? So warm-ups are specific to the individual on the specific day. That's one thing to keep in mind. Number two is that as we, as we progress through our training, certain warm-ups might no longer be effective because we've already got that. We, we're not really engaged with the warm-up, we just kind of go through the motions. So we need to design more engaging warm-ups for you, and that could require a lot of different program design, right? 
So the things we've mentioned to you today, um, we try to design the workshop today to be as specific as possible, given that we don't know really anybody that's watching this, right? So please get in touch with us in the comments, write some questions. That wasn't clear, oh, you missed this. Let us know, we wanna know, and we wanna make it better. So please get in touch with us anytime. And uh, I didn't introduce myself, but my name is DJ, and I'm the co-owner of White Lion Athletics. So, I didn't even get to the chocolate. Damn it. All right. So, be safe, stay well, stay at home. Thank you for watching, and thank you for everybody that made this video possible. All of you that uh, watch our videos, and also those that like, support us through the first of our products, uh, thank you. We really appreciate it. And, uh, well, we, and you'll hear from us again real soon. Thank you. I'm supposed to stay here because there's a delay of 15 seconds if you've watched this far.